Hi and welcome back to the Academy of Historical Fencing. So a question that often comes up is why when we're using sabre and the related weapons of broadsword and spadroon, uh, why do we put the left hand on the hip or hide it away? And um, often people have come up with this concept that it's done for some fancy reason to make it look, you know, look fancy in the fight or, or, or some oddity like that. And I'd like to just blow that one straight out of the water is that everything that is done with the body with this weapon and, and frankly with most weapons is done for a calculated reason um, and there's this this idea amongst some people that's you know a fighting stance will look something more like sort of boxing or longsword or sword and buckler or something like that whereas you know basically a, a right you know lead shoulder on sort of teapot stance as we sometimes jokingly call it with the, with a saber and broadsword it looks somehow overly fancy or I don't know um, unnecessarily strict um, and fancified, yeah, and um, and and basically, I'm just going to look at the reasons why that it's done because it is absolutely done for some very specific and useful reasons, and not at all for show. It is purely functional, and as I said, everything that we do with our body and everything that we do with our sword, with this weapon, and realistically, pretty much all weapons. Is, is done for a calculated reason and there are different methods that can work even within with the same sword but you know there are different calculated reasons to do those different methods and the, you know it's done with with reason and not for some fancy look or fashionable element or anything else like that so when you look at um, let's say broadsword treaties of the 18th century in fact you'll more commonly see basically the the hand up here but it's doing much the same job and what is that well it's keeping it out of the way so if you look back to say rapier treaties of the 17th century uh, and the 16th late 16th you're going to see a lot with the hand quite far forwards sort of roughly in line with the shoulder here really far forwards and the reason for that is that open hand is really really useful for parrying the rapier In some rapier treaties it's very actively done and some it's done a little bit more passively um, but yeah this hand therefore is used an awful lot and realistically it's exceptionally good for parrying thrusts because the thrust is only dangerous on the point Now you could say obviously on the edge if the edge runs along their flesh it can cut and that's quite true you know drawing cuts are part of many martial arts but ultimately in rapier you don't parry a thrust by letting the edge run along your hand you push it aside with a beat so it's just basically slapping the blade um, or grabbing it close to the hilt for example or sometimes actually with an armoured glove that's another thing but that's a bit more specialist but in normal rapier combat you would just use the hands to open hands basically palm off or beat away a thrust which inevitably we can't do with a cut I mean if you were exceptionally quick and with perfect timing maybe there would be a way in reality you're not going to parry most cuts with your arm without taking severe injury so when you're using the rapier which is still a cut and thrust sword for the most part some of them are thrust only but for the most part they're cut and thrust yet the rapier emphasizes thrust more than cut a lot more so so most rapier systems are probably something like 80 percent thrust based to 20 percent cut now that's not a precise figure i'm just plucking that out thin air based roughly on the manuals um, and, and the kind of prevalence of cut versus thrust. So cutting is an important part of rapier, but it's not the most common attack. Now, move on to something like a broadsword, or in this case, a saber. Now, these 1803 sabers, they were based on the 1796 light cavalry saber, which absolutely can thrust. It's uh, a misconception that a well-curved saber can't thrust. It absolutely can thrust. It um, slightly changes the way you're going to thrust because inevitably the curvature takes the point away from the line of attack so you have to change what you're doing a little bit although there are some sneaky ways to use that um, curvature to get the thrust in which are quite interesting but ultimately although we do thrust with a saber like this inevitably thrusting becomes the the less common attack just as the cut is to the rapier and what that means is, is if you keep this hand forward like this as if you wanted to use it for open hand uh, parries and grappling and that kind of thing it's going to get hit and you will find this in your sparring and it happens all the time people always do this particularly people that have done um, a lot of sword and buckler for example or just haven't done much uh, saber is they keep this hand forward and it gets hit it always gets hit because look where it is it's prime basically target 
if I imagine this is my opponent's sword, prime target is to hit the head right here, and if the hand is here, it's right there to get hit. And you'll often find that the palm goes out and you get hit on the underside, so let's say you're wearing a medium to heavy glove, well, those gloves don't have any protection on the inside. So you will find yourself, I've even known people get broken fingers actually, by taking hits on this hand because it was just floating out there when using a sword that has quite a powerful cut. And there is the answer to the question is why is the hand back or hidden? It is to protect it. That's all it is. So it goes onto the hip commonly. As I said, in a lot of broadswords uh, treaties and even in the early Roth editions, you'll also see it up here, but it's still cocked back out the way. So it's we can use this as some degree of counterbalance as well. That's another potential element because you see that in small sword. But it's, it's back here cocked out the way, so it's not in danger. And then you can revert to the resting on the hip, open or, or closed hand, and even in later some manuals actually tuck it all the way behind the back. Personally, I'm not a fan of that because I found on certain actions it strains the shoulder. So I don't recommend sticking the, the, the hand all the way behind the back. But resting it on basically your hip with open or closed um, hand works perfectly well. And, and yeah, it just keeps it out of the way, not only from your opponent, but also for yourself. So if you're using a sword like this, you're probably going to be doing lots of rotational movements like this, which notice the blade can come awfully close to where the hand is. And obviously you don't want to be hitting yourself. It should be obvious, but it might not be until you start using those rotational cuts. So the reason the hand is there is entirely to keep it out of the way. And it's actually not unique to, to Sabre. So another good example of this would be in uh, Meza. So in the German schools of swordsmanship in the, uh, the late medieval Renaissance periods, they did a lot of Meza, the, the, the Grosser Meza, which is the big knife, which is, you know, it's a form of hanger or falchion. And that is a mixed cut and thrust sword, um, usually a bit shorter than this, although not much. And they commonly rest the hand on the hip and they only bring it forward when they get close to do the grappling stages. So it's, and in that regard, it's exactly the same thing. It's keeping it out of the way so that your blade is free to move and it's not just gonna get hit. And, and it will get hit. And you'll see some silly scenarios where people have the hand forward and they sort of, you know, do a slip, for example, to avoid an opponent's shot and the hand still gets hit in a way that if it wasn't there, there would have been no hit, no contact whatsoever. So it's needlessly basically in the way of both your own sword and your opponent's sword. And so we tuck it down onto the hip to keep it out of the way and keep it safe. You'll also find that it brings your body online. And by that I mean if you are my opponent, a squared off stance would be like this. Imagine I'm sat on a horse for example. So this is a square stance because my shoulders are square onto you, equal distance. But in, in Sabre and Brutal we more commonly want to be with our lead shoulder forward. And by bringing the hand down onto the hip, you'll find your shoulder will naturally, your left shoulder or your rear shoulder, will naturally pull back a little bit and encourage this right, basically, hand, right shoulder lead, which is really good for your defense and your reach as well. So that's some of the benefits. There's one other thing that's worth mentioning, and that is scabbards. So. When we train in HEMA, we of course usually do not wear scabbards or sword belts of any kind. So when sabers were actually in use as a military weapon, normally they would be used with a scabbard on, on foot at least. And they would be worn with either a cross belt or a belt with two suspension rings on it. And that gets in the way and you have to control it. And you can see the way it's controlled in certain manuals such as um, the uh, 1799 Angelo um, posters, and you can see that it's basically the scabbard, imagine this is now a scabbard, the scabbard is held roughly at the hip point and sometimes thrown out a little bit, just like we do with our lunging action, but it's doing exactly the same thing as kind of teapot in the hand as we normally do in our sparring. And actually, fencing with scabbards and sword belts is actually a really valuable lesson, and you will find it's ideally suited to just pin in the scabbard there onto the hip in exactly the same way you would in your normal, basically, hand-on hip. Um, with the scabbards of the day, 
if it's on a two-ring suspension, it's going to fly all over the place. It might have a single hook so that the first suspension ring can drop into the hook, but then that scabbard just free floats on one single hook and flops all over the place, can get between your legs and trip you over. And even if you have a bandolier style cross belt, which does hold the sword a little bit more securely, it can still kind of wave or waggle about, not the sword, but the scabbard in that case. Um, again, you'll see that in some of our sparring videos because we've used these kind of belts before and it's quite an interesting exercise. So that is an additional element to it as well. And as time progresses, you go from the 18th century where you see a mix, particularly towards the end of the period, mix between this and this, even going between Roth's first and second edition, you start to see more of the hand on the hip and Roth says you can do either as is comfortable to you. And as British military swordsmanship progresses into the 19th century, you just see this teapot hand on, on the hip being completely standard and completely normal because, well, it works really, really well because when you have the hand up here, it can have a tendency to float forward and get in the way. Keep it on the hip, it stays safe, it's disciplined and structured and works really, really well. So that's my advice on it. That's the reason it was done historically. That's the reason it's in the manuals. It isn't at all about being flowery or, or over the top or, you know, <laughs> anything else whatsoever. It is entirely form and function. So yeah, offhand, on the hip, it'll keep it safe from your own blade and your opponents. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed the video. Please do subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks for watching.